Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'll be teaching you how to play Golem, and for that, I'll be using Tabletop Simulator. Now, we are going to film a full three-player playthrough of this game, and you'll be able to find a link to that in the description of this video once that's published. It's probably going to be about a week until that comes out, so if you'd like to watch it, then please subscribe to the channel so that once I publish it, you'll be able to see it in your feed. Now, I do want to mention that the only reason I'm making this instructional video as well as that playthrough is because Golem was one of the winning games that won the monthly poll that is voted on by the Patreon supporters of the channel. If you enjoy videos like this one and you'd like to see more of them in the future, then please consider supporting that campaign, and you can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash Games. There's a bunch of perks that go along with supporting this channel, including voting for videos like this one, as well as watching some videos early at advertisement free, and in addition to that, there is also exclusive content that I put out there, including impressions episodes. I've already talked about my impressions of Golem in one of those, so if you'd like to hear what I think about this game, then feel free to become a supporter of the campaign, and you'll get access to that. Uh, now, the final thing I'd like to ask is that if you do like this particular video, that you click the like button for it down below, and if you have any thoughts about this game as you're learning it, then please comment down below, because I love to see that kind of feedback. All right, it's now time for me to teach you how to play the game. Out here, we have Golem on the table, and it's not exactly set up. I scattered a few things around to help teaching, so when we actually start the game, it's going to look a little bit different than this. Now, on a broad level, Golem is an engine building game where players are going to be actually constructing golems like this. These golems are going to be walking down the three different districts of the game, and then on a player's turn, they are going to be taking marbles from this synagogue area to perform various actions that are associated with those rows. These actions let you do a wide variety of things, and whenever there is an X, that means it depends on the number of marbles that were in that row when you took that action. So if you took this right here, then the X would be 2, and you would take 2 coins. Likewise, this gets you clay, and that one gets you knowledge. There are also spots that let you upgrade spots on your player board, and you can do other things, like create new golems, make gold bars, and you can also learn new books from the library. Now, in addition to taking marbles over here and taking these actions, once per round, players are going to take their rabbi and move it onto an empty rabbi spot or down to the bottom where any number of players can go, and then you get to do whatever that action says, and I'm sure we'll explain how all of these work in the playthrough video that you can optionally watch later on. Now, I think I'm going to shift from the overview to the actual teach because there are so many things to cover, and I want to spend time in this video actually talking about how this game works. Now, on that note, let's start by discussing the structure of the game. Now, we're going to play through four overall rounds of the game, and those are going to be tracked with these cards over here. Once we finish the first round, we can flip this card over to easily see that we are in the second round, and once we have completed all four rounds, the game will be over and we can calculate final scoring. Now, I'll talk about how that works later on. Let's now talk about how each of these rounds works. Over here, we have a player aid for the round, and as you can see, it shows seven different phases. So we're going to perform all seven of these in each of the four rounds, with the exception of the first round that does not actually happen in the first round of the game. Now, I'll talk about how the first round works a little bit later. Let's now talk about the second round, where everyone's golems are going to move out on the board. Before we move those golems, I do want to mention that each one of the phases in the round happens in turn order, and this is the turn order track. So, hypothetically, the white player would go, then purple, and then teal in this example. Now, in order to move these golems on the board, we have to know how much they are going to move. Now, that number is going to be the addition of the golem movement number on our golem track. As you can see, that's 2 right now with the token there, and if the token was up here, then that would be at the 5. So you add that number up with the number that's over here on the citizen card for the specific round. As you can see, in this round it says plus 1, and in the second round it says plus 2. So that means in this example, in the first round, we would have a golem movement of 1 plus 5, and that means we would have 6 golem movement total. Now we must spend all of that movement if possible, and the way we do this is simple. You just take a golem of your color and you move it to the right one space on the board to use one of the movement. Now these golems can be laying down or standing up, and whenever you move them, they stand up and then you move them over. So that means if a golem is laying down, it will stay laid down until some action in the game moves that golem. Now as you can see, we just used two movement, so we could then go three, four, five, and then move this one again if we wanted for our sixth, or we could move this one for our sixth. Let's focus on this golem that's way out ahead. Now, if we were to move this over here, we would have to pay a penalty of one knowledge or one victory point, and as this golem crosses these thresholds even more, the penalty for crossing these lines goes up. With that in mind, in this example, we would probably move this golem instead, and if we had other golems on the board, we could split this movement amongst them as much as we wanted. 
So once again, in player order, each player is going to use all of their golem movement out here on the board, and then we can move to the third phase of the round, where each player is going to perform three actions. Let's go ahead and focus up here, and as you can see on this layer of the player aid, it shows two marbles as well as the rabbi token. Now what this means is within the round, every player is going to perform two marble actions and one rabbi action, but you can do those in any order of your choice. When you perform a rabbi action, you simply take your rabbi token from off to the side and you place it down onto one of the rabbi action tiles, or you could also put it onto the pre-printed rabbi spot down at the bottom. Now at the start of each round, we're going to randomly shuffle up these from a larger deck and place them out in a random order, so we're going to have different options over here. Once you place the rabbi down, you immediately perform the action of that tile, and again, I'll describe how these work in detail in the full playthrough that we film, and you can find a link to that down below in the description of this video. So, rabbi actions are pretty simple without looking at these icons, you just move your token down onto one of these. Now, you're only going to do that once per round, and the game is four rounds long, so you're going to take four rabbi actions throughout the entire game. Now the marble actions are a little different. In this, you choose any one of the marbles that are currently over here in these rows, and then you can perform all of the actions of that indicated row in any order of your choice. After choosing a marble, you can put it down onto the eyeball spots of your board, and there's two eyeballs to show that you are going to take two marble actions within each round. Now after you take a marble, you might move a student. If you take a yellow, blue, or red marble, then you will likewise move your yellow, blue, or red student once on the board. If instead you take the black marble, then you can move two different students once on the board. And finally, if you take a white marble, you're going to move zero students. Moving students is simple. You just find your student and you move them once to the right in the associated row. This is the blue row here. This one is yellow and this one up top is red. So in this example, we took a blue marble. So our student on the blue row is going to move to the right once. After potentially moving students, we can now perform actions associated with the row where we took that marble from. Now, as I briefly mentioned in the overview, if this area shows X's, then that means that action is dependent on the number of marbles that were in that row before you took one. So again, for an example, this had four marbles in that row when we took the bead, so that means this X is four, and that specific action says we can take four knowledge. In the physical version of this game, you have various tokens to track these resources, but in the tabletop simulator mod, we have these trackers right over here. Let's focus back, and as you can see, this spot is similar, but it gets you X number of coins, and this spot gets you X number of clay from the supply. Now, there is one final X up here, and it's a little different, and I'll explain how this specific action works later. Now, let's look back down over here, because again, when you're taking your action, you can perform all of these things in any order of your choice. We've already talked about getting resources, and now I'm going to skip these arrows and talk about these actions over here. Don't worry, I'll cover the arrows later on. Now, let's start up here. That specific action lets you create a new golem. Let's focus over here, and as you can see, in order to create a new golem, we need to spend three bricks, but we also have to spend three more bricks for every golem that is in the same row where we put the new one. What that means is we could spend three of our bricks to build this golem right here, and then we have to put it down into the leftmost spot of one of these rows, and if we put it into this row right over here, as you can see, there's already another one of our golems, so we'd have to spend three more bricks because of that other golem, and that means this would cost six bricks total. And if this was over here, and we went to build a new golem into this row, there are two other golems, so that means this would cost three plus three plus three, or nine bricks to be built over here. Now I keep saying bricks, I do mean clay, but I'm probably gonna say both of those interchangeably. Now whenever you actually build a new golem, you make sure that they are standing upright. And once again, you must place new golems into the leftmost spot of one of these three different rows. After that, you may have noticed there was an icon under the golem that we just built. This shows two and a fist, and that means we're going to move our golem tracker up exactly two times. So that means we went from having a golem movement value of two to four, plus, of course, whatever is showing up on the citizen. So the more golems we create, the more golem movement we'll have to deal with at the beginning of each round. So that's how we make golems, and the next action is this one right over here. This says that we can spend three coins once in order to gain one gold bar. Once you spend those three coins, you can take a gold from the supply and put it down into an empty gold spot in one of the four different artifact rows that you have on your board. Let's focus over here a little more. Once again, we have these four different artifact rows, and once every single one of the gold icons is covered with a gold token, that is going to activate that artifact for the rest of the game. Once you activate an artifact, you will immediately gain all of the benefits that show up with these little hand symbols over to the right. So that means if you take this one gold bar and put it down here at the bottom, there is just one gold bar needed, so that would activate this artifact, and immediately you would gain one victory point in this case. 
Now it's worth noting that during setup, we are all going to get different artifact tiles like this one, and they are actually double-sided, and we randomize their sides and the number that we use during setup. So in this example, when we place this over here, now we'd get one knowledge instead of that one victory point, and you're going to keep this artifact on that specific side for the entire game. Obviously, if you decide not to go down here but invest in the future, then once you get those other gold bars, you'll get an even more powerful effect. This one says you can move your yellow student to the right once and gain a coin. Once an artifact is complete, in addition to gaining this as an immediate bonus, you will also get this during income, and I'll explain how income works later on. Alright, let's come back to the action board and now discuss this action right here, which lets you take a book from the library. The library can be found in the top right corner of the board, and it's always going to have five face-up cards on it. When you want to purchase a card, you have to spend the knowledge that's listed down below it on the board, and you will also have to spend anything that's printed on the card. So for example, this card would cost three knowledge total, whereas this one over here would cost one knowledge, and then instead of spending extra knowledge, you actually move one of your three students to the left once on their track. Going to the left with students is not necessarily a good thing, but it's also nice not having to spend knowledge. Let's say, for example, that we're going to purchase this card. So that is going to cost three knowledge. And then we're going to take this card and put it above our player board. The next thing that happens is we're going to perform the lightning bolt effect of the card that we just chose. Every card is split with a top part and a bottom part, and the bottom part is always an immediate effect, and the top part could potentially be activated multiple times, and I'll explain how that works very soon. Now in this example, for the lightning bolt effect, we can gain one coin immediately, or we could kill one of our golems. Every time you see this symbol, that means you take a golem from anywhere on the board, and you place it into the cemetery. So, for example, we could take this golem from way over there and place it down onto any empty spot down here in the cemetery. I do want to point out that some of these locations are only playable in certain player accounts. For example, you only use this if you're playing a four-player game, and you only use this if you're playing a three- or four-player game. Now, once you have killed one of your golems, you immediately gain any benefits that you cover up. For example, if we place this right here, that is going to get us one gold bar that we will immediately place in our artifact area, and that could potentially unlock one of our artifacts. After taking the benefit, you can place the killed golem down, and once again, you can only place into spots that are empty, but any number of golems can be placed over here for no immediate benefit. Now, every time you kill a golem, you are going to lower your golem track by one. The golem track is right over here, so you would lower it down like this, and now the amount of golem movement that you have is less because you have less golems out there on the map. Once again, when you make a golem, you move this token up twice, and when you kill a golem, you move it down once. That means as you're playing the game and making golems, invariably this token is going to go up, although there are other effects that can move this token on the track, and it's very likely we'll see some of those effects in the playthrough video, so if you'd like to see how those work, then check the link down below the description once that playthrough is available. Now I suppose I should mention that as soon as you take a card from the library, you always slide the rest of them down to the left, and then after you take the immediate benefit of the card that you've chosen, you then have to tuck this card down into one of the four columns that are shown at the top of our player board. Now, when we tuck these cards, we have to make sure that we don't have the same color card showing up in multiple columns. That means if we tuck this card right over here, in the future, we cannot place this yellow card into any of the other columns. This is the yellow column, so that means this new yellow card would have to be placed over here, and you tuck it underneath the previously placed cards. Now, that's the case for the yellow, green, red, and blue cards, but black cards are actually wild. You can place these down into any of these columns, including columns that already have other colors. So something like that is fine. Or you could potentially take this and start it off like this, and then in the future decide this is a green column and place that card just like this, which then signifies that it's a green column. At this point, I've talked about tucking cards, but it's important to note that we actually have a restriction to the number of cards that we can tuck. Now, this is the study track over here, and we all start on the zero spot. As you can see, that icon says one equal sign and then a book. So that means with this token down here, you can only have one book card in each of these columns. In order to have two stacked up like this, that means your token would need to be at least into the two book area like this. So once we got over here, we could then start stacking. But right now, we could not put a third book into either of these columns until this gets all the way up here to the third book spot. And as you can see, this can go all the way up to a maximum of five tucked cards. Now, the reason this is important is because as soon as you tuck a card, you are then going to activate the entire column, starting from the bottom and working your way up. You'll begin by potentially activating an upgrade that is over here in the column, and I haven't described flipping these over to activate them just yet, and don't worry, I will soon. If this was activated, that would get two victory points, but if it was not, then it would do nothing. Then this one right here says you could spend a coin in order to gain one gold bar, and that one right over there says you can move your yellow student. 
doing multiple things is obviously powerful. And this is why when you are able to stack things like this, you can potentially get even more activations out of them. Again, the token would need to be up here, but now you get to do all of these things starting at the bottom and going up again. So you could get a bunch of gold out of this card if you find a way to keep stacking books on top of that column. All right, we've now talked about buying books, so the next action to talk about is work. Now, this action actually defines the entire row up here, and as you can see, this says 1, 3, 5, or 8 knowledge with a minus X. Now, what that means is you're going to spend 1, 3, 5, or 8 knowledge with the discount of X, which is the number of beads in that row before you take one. And then depending on the number of knowledge that you spent, you can activate one, two, three, or four of your golems out there in the city. So for example, if we wanted to activate three of our golems, we would have to spend five knowledge. But if we did this by taking this marble, then before we did that, there are three marbles total. So the discount would be three. So instead of spending five knowledge, we'd spend five minus three or two knowledge. And then we could activate up to three different golems of ours out there on the board. Now, in order to activate a golem, it must be standing up. That means if it's lying down, you cannot activate this golem, and again, they stand up whenever you move them through any of the various means that you can move golems in this game. Now, when you activate a golem, you're going to lay them down and then perform the action of the tile that is above them in that specific spot. It's worth noting that during setup, we randomly placed 7 out of the 10 total action tiles to choose from for each row. So there's a decent amount of replayability here, with 3 of the tiles not showing up each time you play. Now, each of these actions is different. For example, this one says you could spend four coins in order to move one of your students twice to the right. So you could do this and then move that student, and you can activate these golems in any order of your choice. Down here, for example, if we laid that one down, this says we could spend two knowledge, and then that one with the open book symbol means we could go up once on that study track that I described earlier. Once again, the study track is on the right-hand side of the board. You can see that open book symbol right here, and the higher you go up on this track, the more cards you can stack above your player board. There are other benefits for going up this track, and I'll explain those later on. Our last golem activation example can be right up here. We can lay this golem down, and then that action says we can create a golem at a discount of 3 clay. So that is just like the make a golem action we've talked about earlier, and you can then place the golem out onto one of these spots, although it's important to note that you are never allowed to activate a golem that you made during the same work phase. So if we made a golem right over here, we would not be able to activate it to get these two clay resources that are above it. Once you are done activating golems, your turn is over, and again, you can tell they are activated because they are lying down. Now, there's a bunch of icons out here, and I'm not going to go into those details right now. Once again, if you watch the playthrough video that will be coming out later, I'm sure we'll describe how just about all of these work while we're playing. Well, I think the time has finally come for us to talk about these upgrade actions. When you take a marble from the specific row, in addition to doing the other things we've talked about, you can do a specific upgrade of that color. There are blue, yellow, and red upgrades, and all of these show up on our player boards. Let's start by talking about blue upgrades. As you can see, there are five tiles along the top of the board that each have this blue upgrade arrow, and there's also this large tile right over here that shows the blue upgrade arrow down there as well. Now, in order to perform this upgrade, you simply spend the knowledge that shows up on there. So, for example, this one right here costs three knowledge, so we can spend that three knowledge and then flip this over, and that is a completed upgrade. Now, every time you upgrade any of these tiles, you'll notice we have gained these blue menorahs. Every one of these tiles gives you one blue menorah, except for this one over here that gets you three, and you can easily see a grayed out version of that on the non-upgraded side. These menorahs are very important for endgame scoring, and I'll talk about how those work later on. Now, with these tiles up here, whenever you place a new card up into that column, you again activate from the bottom going up, and that includes activating that upgrade tile. It's worth noting when you actually upgrade the tile, nothing happens immediately. You only gain these benefits when you place cards above them. And again, this over here just gives you endgame scoring benefits of getting three menorahs, whereas the rest of these give you one. Now, there is one final tile, and that's over here. And as you can see, when you flip this over, it gets easier to get to the threshold that we need to stack more cards. And also, there's more of these little hand symbols, which will happen during income. And again, I'll explain how that works later on. Just like the rest of these, though, you'll notice this tile has one menorah. Now, all told, there are eight menorahs that we can get through flipping all of the blue upgrades. Now, the rest of these benefits should be self-explanatory, except for this one right over here. 
Now that says that once you've flipped over this upgrade, you can perform the lightning bolt effect twice on the card that you just placed into that column. So for example, if we took this green card right over here, the lightning bolt effect says we can gain two knowledge, and then we can either move golems forward two times or backwards two times, and we can split that amongst our golems. Now, if we place that into this column after this was flipped, then we could perform this twice, which means we would get four knowledge, and then we could move golems forward or backward twice, and then do that again. Now, this little restriction over here means if you place a black card into this column, you do not get that benefit. So in this example, you would gain one gold bar or move up once on the study track, and you would not double that lightning bolt effect because, again, this is black. And as you can see, that shows the student going to the left, and that is always the cost of the black cards. So that's why the icon's used to show that it doesn't count for black cards. All right, let's now move on to the red upgrades. Now these all exist right over here, and they let you actually upgrade your golems themselves. As you can see, you have to spend a certain amount of clay to flip each of these over, and then the effects on that specific upgrade are going to become active, and as you can see, every one of them has a red menorah, except for this one over here, which just gets you three red menorahs. So just like the blue upgrades, if you fully upgrade red, there are eight menorahs that you can gain. Now, as you may have noticed, there's quite a few icons on these, and some of them have lightning bolts. For example, this one right over here says as soon as you flip this over, you're going to kill one of your golems, and for the rest of the game, including this one, you will get double the rewards for the cemetery spot where you place that golem down. This one over here says you can immediately activate one of your golems, and then for the rest of the game, when you perform a work action, you can activate one of your golems for free. Now, these are the only two with lightning bolt effects, but the other spots also have some interesting options. This one over here says that whenever you are moving your golem during the golem move step, you can optionally ignore the modifier from the citizen card that can be found in the top left corner of the board. So you can add this to that card, or you could just ignore it from that card, which means your golems will move less, which can be a good thing. This one right over here says every time you create a new golem, you can then immediately move that golem once to the right in its associated column. That is optional, and then also optionally, you can activate that golem without lying it down. So you gain the benefit of the spot above that golem, and you keep it standing up so that you might be able to activate it and gain the same benefit from that spot later on in the game. Now there is one final upgrade, and that's this one up here, and this involves paying less knowledge to control your golems, and I haven't actually talked about this just yet, so we'll come back to this one when we actually discuss controlling golems. All right, let's now move on to the yellow upgrades. Now these are a little different than the others. As you can see, these are the upgrade tiles you can take, and none of them, except for this bottom one, actually have a cost on them. This one costs eight coins to be flipped over, and you probably aren't surprised to see that gives you three of the yellow menorahs, but the rest of these have their costs printed on your artifact board. In order to place one of these over here, for example, that is going to cost you four coins, and if you decide to place it over there instead, that spot is going to cost you three coins. Now, whenever you fully activate an artifact, remember, you're going to gain everything that shows up over here, so that means if earlier on in the game you placed this onto that spot, and then you took this gold bar and you placed it over there to activate this artifact, in addition to gaining one knowledge, you will also gain two clay. Now, this has a hand symbol on it, which means it'll happen during income, and again, I'll talk about how income works later. Now what this means is by placing one of these down, nothing immediately happens, but if you upgrade something before you activate that artifact, you might gain extra benefits. Now this is how these specific ones work, although I do want to point out that these are all double-sided. The back side gets you one of the associated resource and a victory point, whereas the front side just gets you two of that resource. Now we only have three of these, and there are four slots that you can put them down into, so you have to make some decisions here for where you will put them in order to get the most effect for yourself. Now there are two other types of yellow artifacts that look just like this. Each one of these is double-sided, and you're going to place these onto the boiler spots over here on the artifact. Once again, you're going to spend the coins that are listed on that specific location, and then you'll choose one of these and place it onto that spot. And if that artifact is active and this condition is met, then you can gain these benefits. So for example, if we place this right over here, we'd spend one coin. And since this is active, that means in the future, every time we take a blue marble from the main synagogue board, we are going to reactivate all of these things. Now we could flip this over to the red side if we wanted to, and the other option is this. Now that says that once this artifact is activated, every time you place a book into a new column, so the first book in that column, you will activate this. And the flip side says every time you create a new golem, then that will also activate this. That means this one can be activated a maximum of four times per game because you can only make four golems and you can only place a first book into a column four times. Now, just like the rest of these upgrades, as you can see, once you've fully upgraded it, there are eight menorahs that you will gain at the end of the game.
At this point, I've talked about all of this stuff, but I haven't quite covered this bottom row. This one's actually relatively simple. By pulling a marble from this area, you can then spend one coin and then perform all of the actions of any one of these other rows. So you're essentially mirroring one of the other rows, and the X value will be affected by the number of marbles in this bottom row, not the row that you are mirroring into. Now, in addition to doing everything on the row that you mirrored into, you can also spend three of your coins to study once by going up once on this study track. Well, at this point, I've talked about all of the actions, and the last thing to mention is passing. Now, we are still in this third round where we're going to take two marbles and do one rabbi action, but instead of performing one of those, you can do a pass action by taking the lowest number pass token, and you put it in front of yourself. So if you're the first person to pass, you'll take the one and put it over here, and if you're the second person to pass, you take this over there. Once you have passed, you're going to take no more actions for the rest of this action round. And once all players have finished all of their actions or passed, we're going to move into the first out of potentially two passing rounds. Let's say that we passed and the blue player down here passed. Now, when we start a passing round, the person who took this first passing token is going to take one marble from the board and place it down into one of these empty slots. So, for example, we could take this blue marble and put it right over there. After that, we're going to take all of the marbles, shuffle them up, and then pour them back into the marble tower. And in the Tabletop Simulator mod, we do that by clicking this Shuffle Beads button down here. But in real life, you just collect them from everywhere except for the player boards and from these passing tokens over here. Obviously, because one marble was taken, there is one less marble over here to choose from. And now, at the start of this first passing round, we go in this player order, having each player take the turns that they haven't done yet. Remember, you must take two marble actions and one rabbi action. Now, you're going to follow the new turn order, which is defined by the passing tokens that each player has. And if you want to, you can pass again in this first passing round, which means you'll take no more actions. And once everybody has either passed again or taken their actions, you will take another marble of your choice, place it over here, and once again, shuffle all of these up and then perform your final actions. Since this passing token only has two spots on it, that means it can only be used twice. So that means overall, there's always going to be a main action phase. Sometimes there will be a first passing phase and sometimes a final second passing phase before we end this third overall phase of the round. All right, let's now talk about the fourth phase of the round, which is where we're going to modify turn order. Now, we do this based off of the rabbi positions that we put our tokens down into. The rabbi farthest to the top is going to give that player first player for the next round. The next rabbi up is going to make that player second. So in this example, teal would be next. And then finally, the purple player down here would be third. Now, it's possible that multiple players could have gone to this pre-printed rabbi action down at the bottom, and if they did, you start at the left and you work your way to the right, and the person farther to the left will go earlier in turn order in the next round of the game. So in this example, purple would actually be second, and then teal would be third for the next round of the game. After that, we can move into the fifth step of the round, where all players can potentially perform the character action that's shown on the character card in the top right corner of the board. Now, earlier I mentioned that we can use these to track what round it is, but I'm sure you were curious what the actual icons on these cards meant. Now, each of the citizens shows two of these marble colors, and every player who has the exact match for these colors gets to then perform one of the options down below. Now, it's important to note that white marbles don't move your students when you take them, but they do count as a wild for this. That means in order to activate this citizen, you need a yellow and a red for your two marbles, or you could have a white and a red, or a yellow and a white, or you could have two white marbles. That would work as well. Now, whenever you activate a citizen, you either take three gold, which is the option at the bottom of all of them, or you could spend the associated amount of gold to perform the actions dictated on the right-hand side once. So, for example, this one over here would let you spend two gold to then perform an upgrade of any of the colors at a discount of four, and you'd get one victory point. Now, at the start of the game, all of these are revealed, and we can pay attention to them as we're making our plans. It's worth noting the first three are shuffled up from a deck of one to threes, whereas the fourth one is always from a deck of fours, and these can offer a ton of victory points that you certainly want to keep in mind as you are playing through the game. For example, this one says you could spend five coins to get one victory point for every upgrade you've done, and since this is out in the game, you're probably going to be more interested in upgrading to get these points once it's over versus a different round four card like this one, which gives you extra victory points for moving your students evenly down the board. Now, each player who can perform that card is going to do it in the new turn order, and once we're all done with that, we can move to the sixth phase, where we are all going to collect our income, and then after that, we can perform one upgrade of our choice. Now, this hand symbol means every single hand symbol that we have is going to give us whatever it says. 
and those hand symbols can be found in four different locations in the game. Three of those exist on our player boards. As you can see, they're over here on the study track. So the location where our study marker is, is going to get us a knowledge income as well as potentially getting us victory points. And when we unflip this, you can see that there are no victory points you can gain. So this is another reason to flip this over because you get more knowledge and you can gain victory points for free as part of your income. Next up, there is the golem track over here, and as you can see down the left side, you will either lose or gain victory points depending on how far it is up. So that means if this is really high, you're going to have a lot of golem points to have to deal with, but you'll also get more victory points in income. The next income we will take is over here from the artifacts. These are going to be only for artifacts that are actually completed, which means all of the gold bar icons have been covered. And for each of those activated artifacts, you get all of the hand symbols. So once again, over here, we would get one knowledge and two clay as income because this artifact is activated. So that's three ways we can get income, but there is one last way and it's printed out here on the board, specifically on the streets that our students are walking down throughout the game. Now, every spot where you have a student is going to give you income. For example, this student being right here would get us a one coin income, and that student would get us two clay. If this student happened to be way up here, then that would get us two knowledge and three victory points. And gaining these income bonuses is certainly a factor for why you want to move your students to the right. Now, speaking of moving students, I do want to mention that the first student to cross over this spot is going to gain this menorah token. That is going to go to that specific player, and that is potentially a ninth menorah that they could score at the end of the game. Of course, they might score less than that. They just add this to their overall menorah scoring, and I'll talk about how that works soon. So there's a bit of a race. If multiple students are getting close to the end, one of the players might try to push even faster to get that token before their opponent does. Now, once we've all taken income, once again, we can all perform one upgrade of our choice. That's gray, so that means you could choose any of the different colors, and you, of course, have to spend the indicated resources associated with that upgrade when you do it. Once we finish the sixth step, it's then time for the final step of the round, where we are going to have to essentially control our golems. As you can see, this shows a student icon and a golem, as well as a cost in knowledge. So let's focus back on the board. Now these golems are in our control, sort of, but the farther to the right they go away from our students, the more knowledge we're gonna have to spend to thematically keep them in control. Specifically, we have to spend one knowledge for each of the columns that the golem is ahead of the student in that specific district. So right over here, the student is on that spot and the golem is three steps ahead. So we would have to spend three knowledge in order to do this. If the golem was on the same spot, then that's fine. We don't have to pay any knowledge penalty. Now, if we don't have enough knowledge to fully pay for the penalties that come from the golems that are too far ahead of our students, we will then first spend all of our knowledge, and then for every golem we were not able to fully pay that effect for, we are going to lose five victory points. So it's very important to not let these golems get too far ahead, or if they are far ahead, you better make sure you have a lot of knowledge to be able to pay that penalty. With that in mind, we can come back over here and look at this red upgrade, because this shows a max of two. That means when you are paying this penalty, you will pay at most two knowledge for every golem that is ahead of one of your students. So if a golem is eight spaces ahead of that student, instead of spending eight knowledge, if this is flipped over, you will only spend two for that specific golem. So this upgrade can be really beneficial if your golems are running too far ahead. Of course, if your golems are too far ahead, you can also try to find a way to kill them to remove them from the board so you don't have to worry about that knowledge penalty. Once we've all finished the seventh step, we can move on to the next round of the game. We will then flip over the citizen card to show that that round is done, and then perform the first step of the round, which I haven't described just yet, and let's talk about it now. The first thing that we do is we collect all of the marbles, and we are going to dump them back down into the synagogue. The way we do this in Tabletop Simulator is we just click this button right down here, and it handles it automatically. After that, we can remove all of the rabbis, and then we're gonna get rid of all of these rabbi cards, and then deal out new ones. And you're gonna place them out so there's always one more than the number of players. So in a three player game, we would have four of these to choose from. Now the next thing that we do is we remove the leftmost book card, and then slide them over and reveal a new one. The card that you remove is actually placed to the bottom of the deck. And then when all of these slide, they will get cheaper, and then we can see a new one. Once that is complete, it's then time for the golem movement step, which I've already described earlier on in this video. Now that we've covered how a round works, I think it's time to talk about what happens when the game is over. Remember, we are going to play through four rounds in the game, and then we'll calculate our final scores, and there's a nice player aid for that as well. At the top of the player aid, it shores our scoring disc to show that we start final scoring with however many points we've gained throughout the game. 
After that, we are then going to score our red, then blue, and then yellow menorahs. And the way this works is relatively similar for each. For the red menorahs, we are going to count the number of those that we have in our entire area, and we will multiply that by the number of empty golem spots we have on our board. During the setup of the game, we put two golems out, and then as the game's going on, we can create up to four more. So if we ended the game with two of these empty spots, we would multiply two by the number of red menorahs we have. In this example, we have one, two, three, four, five. So in this example, we get two times five, or ten points, for our red menorah scoring. Now remember, you could potentially get more menorahs by moving your student down that track. So for this blue example scoring, we have eight showing from these tiles, plus one right over here, so that's nine. And then for the blue, you multiply that by the number of book columns that have at least one card in them. So looking over here, we have two columns with books, two that don't, so our modifier would be nine menorahs times two, or 18 victory points. Now if we had that many blue menorahs, it's likely we would have tried to make a new column, because obviously that new column in this case would be worth nine extra points due to the nine menorahs that we'd have. Finally, we could score the yellow menorahs, and we just count up the number of those that we have, multiplied by the number of artifacts that we have activated. In this example, we have two activated artifacts. This one isn't quite activated because not all of the icons are full. So in this example, we have three, four, five, six times two, or 12 points that we would get for the yellow menorah scoring. After that, it will then be time to score our objectives. Now, I haven't discussed these up to this point in the video, and during the game, each player is going to have three objectives in front of them, and they potentially could get more. Now, during the setup of the game, all players are going to get four random objectives. We will then keep one of them and then pass the rest to our right. We will then get three from the person on our left and then choose one of those from those three and then continue to pass until we have four of these cards in front of ourselves. And then we will choose three out of these four to keep for our objectives. And there are specific actions in the game that can get you more of these. Once the game is over, we will score all of the objectives that we have in our hand, and if you meet the uh, threshold at the top of the card, you get the points in the middle, and then you might get extra points for doing a variety of different types of objectives. For example, this objective gets us two points if our yellow student is at the fifth or farther spot, and this one gets us six points if our yellow student is at the eighth or farther spot. Obviously, these work really well together, but they are also the same type. If we look down over here, it says that for each different type of objective we've completed, we will gain bonus points. So what that means is if we completed all of these four throughout the game, we would have three types. One is for yellow student movement, one is for upgrades, and one is for our study track. Having three different types would get us five extra points, but of course if this was a different type, then we'd have four different types, and that would get us nine points. Now, having more points down here is good, but also having the same type makes it easier to complete multiple objectives because they dovetail into each other. Now, before we move on with final scoring, I want to briefly mention these resource tiles. During setup, we get four of them randomly, and then we will keep two of them and then discard the others, and these will dictate all of our starting resources and potential benefits that we get before the game starts. In this example, we would get three clay, one knowledge, one coin, and we'd start the game moving up twice on the study track. But if we did this instead, we could start with our student moving, and there are other resource tiles that might give you upgrades before the game even begins. I know I didn't talk about setup, and there's many more steps to it, but I don't think it makes sense to go through those steps right now. I just wanted to mention what these were. You're not actually going to have them in your hand as the game plays. You're just going to gain these benefits and then discard all of these tokens before we start. Let's come back to final scoring, and the next thing involves bonus points for the study track. Over here on the left side, there are victory points with that arrow in the line, and you get those victory points if your token is at that spot at the end of the game. So if this was here, we would get four points at the end of the game, and if we made it all the way to the top of the track, we get seven points at the end of the game. Finally, we are going to add up all of our resources and then divide that by five and then round down, and then for each of those five chunks, we will gain one victory point. Once we finish final scoring, the player with the most points will be the winner, and if there is a tie, then that is broken by the rabbi positions that were taken in the last round of the game. The player with the highest rabbi will break the tie in their favor. Now at this point, I've taught all of the basics to this game, but there are a bunch of icons that I haven't discussed just yet, and I think I'm going to save those for the actual playthrough. Uh, I know that this wasn't completely exhaustive, but there's a lot going on in this game, and I think this is certainly more than enough to actually start playing the game. The game does come with a great glossary at the end of the rulebook to fully explain how all of these different tiles work, as well as the rabbi tiles and various other icons that are in the game.
Well, I think that's going to bring this instructional video to a close. I hope you enjoyed learning how to play Golem, and if you are interested in it, then please check out our full three-player playthrough of the game. It's not going to be released at the same time as this video, so if you'd like to keep an eye out for it, then please subscribe to this channel, and hopefully it'll get published within a week or so of this video going live. And once that playthrough is out, I will also put a link to it down below in the description of this one. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.